I want to show you something. In the UK, about an hour outside of Oxford, there's this small city called Coventry. And back in the 1960s and 70s, Coventry was home to a large South Asian immigrant population, a lot of whom were Indians. Now, one day in 1969, one of them, a Punjabi housewife named Preetam Kaur, she had been feeling a little unwell over the past few days and decided to get it checked out. The doctor told her that her symptoms were being caused by anemia and that there was this new health program that they were running which would help her with her issues. Apparently, because it was a nutrition issue, they would provide her with some specially prepared extra nutritious rotis which would help her regain her health. Now, the program was completely free and rotis are anyway a big part of the Indian diet, so Preetam saw no harm in just trying it out and she signed up for the program. Now, in the following days, every morning, someone from the medical team would come to Preetam's house and deliver a roti and by the afternoon, someone from the medical team would call her to check if she had eaten it. Now, what Preetam did not know at the time was that she and 20 other South Asian women who had been part of this program were being poisoned. These rotis had been laced with a radioactive material and they had unknowingly become part of a secret human radiation experiment being run by the British government. Look, I get that this sounds like a conspiracy theory and boy, I wish it was. But sadly, it's not. This is the horrifying true story of one of the British government's most unethical human experiments. One that particularly targeted vulnerable South Asian and Indian women. One that was kept hidden from the public for decades on end. Today, I want to tell you the story of the Coventry experiment because what happened to these women deserves to be known by as many people as possible. My name is Teet Saha and you are watching Under the Radar. Our story starts in the early 1960s when an Irish scientist named Peter Elwood was driving his car down a road in the city of Belfast, lost in his thoughts. You see, he had become obsessed with this medical mystery known as anemia. And it was here, in his car on that day, that Peter Elwood had an idea that would lead to Preetam Kaur and 20 other South Asian women being fed radioactive rotis 10 years later. If she knew about it, she would not eat in it. To properly understand this wild chain of events, you must first understand what anemia is. Basically speaking, it's a condition where your blood is unable to carry enough oxygen to your tissues and organs, leaving you constantly exhausted, tired, and may even lead to other more serious conditions. Now, by the 50s and 60s, doctors and scientists knew a couple of things about anemia for sure. They knew that iron deficiencies were a leading cause of anemia. They also knew that the condition affected women more, and especially, women of certain regions of the world, such as, you guessed it, South Asia. But what science didn't fully understand was exactly how the human body absorbed iron from their diet in the first place. If they could just figure that out, they could start designing supplements and treatment plans for people with anemia and iron deficiencies. And this is where Peter Elwood came in. Sitting in his car that day, he had a bright idea. He said, what if there was a way to tag the iron molecules in your food? Because then you could monitor its progress within the body with much greater precision than had ever been possible. You could see where the iron goes in the body, how much of it gets absorbed, which foods lead to the most iron absorption and how we can artificially supplement that. Kind of like putting an air tag on your luggage and monitoring it remotely. And the air tag that Elwood chose was radioactivity. Before you get concerned, it's completely normal. That's not the problem. Radioactivity is a common enough tool used in a lot of medical procedures. The problem starts with the experiment that he designed to test it out. That is where things start getting super shady. Throughout the Cold War, British and American scientists carried out hundreds of radiation experiments on vulnerable people. Now, to carry out this experiment, Elwood needed three things. One, a group of people that were most affected by anemia. Two, a food item that they would regularly consume that could be used to administer iron into their body. And three, a way to tag that iron. 
Now, given how, as we've discussed, anemia seems to affect South Asian women disproportionately, Elwood realized that the Indian immigrant community of Coventry would provide a great pool of test subjects. He also knew that bread was a great delivery mechanism for iron and that his test subjects regularly consume bread in their normal diet in the form of rotis. So it was a match made in heaven. And for the tagging mechanism, Elwood and his team decided to use a radioactive isotope of iron called Fe59. It's still technically iron, but once it enters the body, you can track where it goes and how much of it gets absorbed by checking radiation levels of the body before and after the intake. To Elwood, this was the perfect solution. I mean, sure, look, finding volunteers for this kind of a test might be a little difficult given the whole, you know, eating radioactive stuff. It is a little scary and the health risks are a little too complicated for the average person to understand. You might have to educate them a little bit more. But look, I feel like all of this can be easily managed, you know, giving the potential test subjects enough information, getting informed consent from them, monitoring the test subjects' health before and after the experiment, and, you know, just taking care of them and following proper medical protocol. It's not that hard, right? Right? What followed in the next few months was a study that in today's day and age would strip any doctor or researcher of their license and probably land them in jail. But back then it must have been quite normal because Elwood got proper funding and approval for this entire project from the UK government's own Medical Research Council or MRC. Now, here's what happened next. Elwood knew that most of his target pool of test subjects, South Asian immigrant women of Coventry, visited this one Indian doctor named Dr. Shah. So as step one, he roped in Dr. Shah to act as the face of the program. He knew that there was a higher chance of these women trusting an Indian doctor and agreeing to be enrolled into this program. Now, what exactly Elwood told Dr. Shah to convince him and how much of the research project's true intentions was revealed to him is unknown because Dr. Shah died a long time ago and, you won't believe this, there are no records of the interactions between Elwood and Dr. Shah. By the way, this lack of records and documentation is something you'll notice happening repeatedly through the story. Just keep track. Now, from what records have been uncovered, it is clear that Dr. Shah convinced 21 South Asian women to join this new health program. Now, we can never be really sure of what Dr. Shah told them, but from the victim's account, it seems like they had visited him for simple things like migraines and body aches and they were told that there's this new health program which will cure them of all their diseases like some kind of magic miracle medicine they believed all the time it's gonna help them and once these 21 test subjects were selected Elwood and his team stepped in. Over the next few weeks, a member of Elwood's team called Tom Benjamin would visit each of these women's houses in the morning and deliver a radioactive roti. And then he would either call or return in the afternoon to make sure that they had eaten it. And after 17 days of this bizarre routine, one morning, this gentleman arrived at seven, man. came to our house in a van. He, he took her, my mother and Tanti and her girl. But instead of a hospital, this van took these women to a place called the Harwell Laboratory. Harwell was an atomic research center. There, these women were put into large machines and a number of tests were conducted. At no time, they ever told them that they had taken part in some sort of an experiment. And then, once their purpose was fulfilled, they were dropped back home and that was it. They were never contacted again. There was no medical aftercare. They weren't even given the results of the study that they had been a part of. A year later, in 1970, Elwood published a paper titled Absorption of Iron from Chapati Made from Wheat Flour. In this report, they were just nameless data points. And over the next few years, these women and their participation in this health program were completely erased from history. Elwood, on the other hand, went on to have a very successful career. But in 1995, decades after this shady project had been swept under the rug and kept hidden from the public, one man dug it up and all the secrets came tumbling out. In the 1990s, a British filmmaker named John Brownlow came across a scandal that was rocking the American medical community. That human beings were injected with a material 
which is used to trigger atomic bombs. Eileen Wilson, an American journalist, had exposed a series of unethical human radiation experiments that were carried out in America at the height of the anemia mania in the 1960s. There was a reference to 18 people who had been injected with plutonium. I mean, there was something about it that I found repugnant. And for this wonderful piece of journalism, she was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. And as John started going through Eileen's findings and reports, a terrible thought entered his own mind. If the Americans had done it, how can the British have been far behind? The British government deny carrying out similar experiments. And that is when he himself started investigating. And after weeks and weeks of scouring through MRC archives and records, something caught his eye. It was this study. And the more he dug through the study, and the circumstances surrounding it, the more it became clear to him that the kindest thing you can say about this whole affair was that it was unethical. It had also become clear to John that if he wanted the whole truth, he would need to speak directly to the participants of the study, the 21 women. But as we've already seen, these women were already long forgotten. And surprise, surprise, the MRC and Elwood said that they hadn't even maintained records of the names of these 21 women. But somehow, in an excellent piece of investigative journalism, John Brownlow and his team canvassed Coventry neighborhoods door to door for weeks on end until they tracked down one participant. Her name was Pritam Kaur. She was now quite old, but she and her son agreed to be interviewed by John and his team and present their side of the story. Like mother just told me right now, if she knew about it, she would not have eaten it. Following the testimony of Pritam Kaur, the daughter of another one of these 21 women came forward. Her mother was no longer alive, but she told the reporters that her mother had suffered health problems her entire life, including cancer. Now, maybe all of that was caused by the radioactive rotis or maybe it wasn't. We don't know. And that is the problem. The research team made no follow-ups and kept no records of patient health after the study was completed. When Brownlow's documentary finally came out, it sent a shockwave throughout England and especially Coventry. People just couldn't believe that such an unethical experiment had taken place right under their noses. People have to get up and raise their voice. Now facing immense public pressure, in 1995, the MRC decided to launch an official investigation and publish their findings in this report. Now look, when I was first going through this report, I had kind of expected the MRC to kind of try to sweep things under the rug and, you know, protect their own. And that's fine. All organizations across the world do it. That's just how things happen. But I guess even I was a little taken aback by just how lightly they had taken this whole incident. They had basically believed Elwood's testimony and completely disregarded everything that these two women had been saying. And the whole argument was basically, well, it was the 60s. It's just how we did things back then. And sure, we don't have any written records or proof that these women understood what they were signing up for and had given proper consent. And sure, we did feed them irradiated rotis, but the dosage was so low, it doesn't really matter. And this is what Alice Stewart, a world-renowned physician and epidemiologist, had to say about their response. I call that a plain lie. I think it's taking advantage of the uh, uh, situation of not being able to understand the language. Now, let's pause here for a second because this next part is super important. I'm sure a lot of you are still wondering if this was truly an unethical study or if things are being blown out of proportion. Okay, fair enough. Let's dive deeper into that. Look, we're not talking about some shady, unlicensed doctor working out of a garage. We're talking about a brilliant researcher, Peter Elwood. Yes, he is a brilliant researcher, working with the UK government's Medical Research Council. So you would expect them to have proper documentation of these women having signed up for this study. Like, I don't know, um, consent forms? Nope. When the documentary came out and people started questioning him, he simply said, I didn't keep any records. All right, all right, maybe the experiment was truly harmless. Can we at least have the names of the 21 participants so we can corroborate your story? Nope. Elwood and his team and the MRC have no records of the names of the participants of this study. Let me be very clear. It's not that they won't reveal it because of patient confidentiality. They said they don't have it. We only know the names of Pritam Kaur and that one other woman because of John Brownlow's documentary investigation. The other 19 are unknown till date. Okay, okay, fine. Let's assume even that is not a problem. These 21 patients, these women, must have at least received the results of the medical study that they had signed up for, right? Nope. 
These women were handed nothing. There were no follow-ups, no check-ins. These women were forgotten the day they were dropped back home from the Harwell Atomic Center. Now, let me make something very clear. I don't think Elwood and his team were inherently evil people who had set out to do some crazy experiment. No. In fact, I think that the underlying aim of the study was to do good. I also don't really care about the radioactivity aspect of it because it is quite common in controlled medical studies. My only problem is the careless and frankly unethical way in which Elwood went about conducting this study and because of that, it's very hard not to believe that this wasn't just another continuation of the age-old colonial tradition, one where white researchers simply see native bodies as subjects to be experimented on and not patients. Across the world, for centuries, people of color have been used as guinea pigs in unethical experiments, often without consent, always without justice. And this is how these 21 women seem to have been treated. Now, in 2023, this whole story exploded on social media thanks to historian Dr. Louise Raw, whose thread went viral. People were furious and a Coventry politician, MP Taiwo Owatemi, demanded a full investigation, calling it a disgrace and a case of medical racism. But it's still been two years since then and no one has been held accountable and that's why we decided to tell this story. Because Preetam Kaur and the 20 other women deserve to be more than just a paragraph in a government report that will again be swept under the rug. They at least deserve the right to have their side of the story heard and remembered. Somebody will come and see you at your house and give you this chapati and you eat it for a few days then we will take you and check you out. And if nothing else, at least public awareness of the story might just prevent more Coventry experiments happening in the future.